We'll start the recording and I'm going to pop back into our module five. Hello there, 580 fighters. I hope you're doing well during this time of uncertainty. Uh, we are going to go ahead and do part two of our module five on assessment. I hope these videos are coming to you in a way that you find that they're um, helpful. And today, what I want to do is Last week, we looked at the whole um, engaging part of Fullen's work. Now I want to look at something that he really doesn't address very much in his books, um, and that's assessment. So when we talk about assessment in a classroom, are we looking at technology as a way to make it easier to collect data because that's what assessment should be about. It should be about you collecting data about how your kids are learning. Um, or can it be a way for you to interject into the learning and the assessment? Let's look at three different ways of thinking about assessment. The first way that I, I think that uh, we should be looking at it is in terms of what do we think about assessment, the, what we have to do as teachers. Well, I think one of the first things we have to do is we have to think about what are we using assessment for? And I think that one of the tools that, that really speaks to us very eloquently when we look at uh, technology use as an assessment is its use as a formative assessment. Um, everything we're going to play with today can be viewed through the lens of formative assessment, very simply. And the beauty of it is the creation of it doesn't take any time at all. And it's always there. And, you know, if you follow what we talked about with Google Classroom, using your Google Drive as your teacher's closet, then you have all this wonderful capability. But what's even more wonderful about it is sitting down and cranking out a, a Google Forms assessment uh, to be used as an exit slip or to be used as a way of checking for understanding in the room doesn't take any time at all to do. Now, when you think about formative assessment and these others that we're going to be looking at, one of the things that I love about Edpuzzle is the fact I can take a video, and by the way, I keep saying YouTube videos, and I shouldn't do that because you can use lots of different videos inside of Edpuzzles, I'll show you. Um, the fact that you can insert in your voice or you can insert your formative assessment into that video at the appropriate times that you think that it needs to be there for to check for kids' understanding. Again, and with Edpuzzle, you can link it to your Google Classroom, so therefore when they take the little Ed Puzzle test that you create, the information gets dumped over to you. Now, here's one, and by the way, when I talk about this, I'm talking about it in terms of, when I say formative, you know, I think a formative and summative are basically used two sides of the same coin. Um, we think of summative assessment as being that, the summative of the assessment. Uh, I kind of wonder sometimes if we rely upon that too much, where the formative assessment really gives me the trend data that I'm looking for. Summative is that one chance, and if you blow it, we've blown it. But when I look at data over a period of time, in other words, when I look at how kids are learning and I see that they started at this level and they were up to here, then I can make some pretty good statements about are we actually learning something here? Summative in my mind should look more like project-based learning. It should look more like creating something. It should look more like application. Uh, it was Wiggins and McTeague, um, two guys that you keep hearing me talk about all the time. What they look at is there is that sort of acquisition of, of learning. And then they see kids doing demonstrations of learning. And then they see transfer of learning. Now, when you read 
Wiggins and McTeague, they don't dismiss um, assessment, formative assessment or formal assessment, summative assessment. They don't dismiss that. But they also put in something that they call facets of understanding, which is different ways for kids to demonstrate uh, their understanding. And I kind of lean more toward that, as you can tell. Uh, I, I find that when we ask people to do demonstrations of, of understanding, we get a better sense of where their heads are about it. Let me look at one more and then we'll move on to the fun stuff. This is one that we don't use anymore. And I think we should. There was a trend, if you will, fad, if you want to be, you know, negative about it, in education in the 80s, I believe it was. No, late 70s, excuse me. It was all about ipsative assessment. An ipsative assessment is something you use every single day in your life. And you m think about what it could mean. Well, let's look at the two definitions of what we usually think of as tests. So we have norm reference tests, which compares a test taker against his or his peers. Yeah, you might compare my results with the, of any other person. A criterion reference test measures a test taker against external criteria. In other words, it looks at how did you score on this test against other people. An ipsative assessment is a way of you measuring yourself. And as I said, you use it all the time. When you sit down and you think about, I need to lose weight. I need to exercise more. I need to walk more. All these things are ipsative assessment in nature. So you ask, well, how would that work in a, in a classroom? So an ipsative assessment in a classroom, the term that was used mostly was called contract learning. How do you sit, sit down and say, this is what I'm gonna do in this classroom to get an A. This is what I'm gonna do to get a B. And then you measure how you're doing with that as you go along. And the dog is crying upstairs, and I don't know why. I may have to go deal with this and see if he's going to stop. He does that when nobody's around. And I'm downstairs, so I don't know why he, you know, just doesn't come down here and get me. Okay, things have stopped. <laughs> Sorry about that. Yes, I'm at home. Um, I find working here in the studio and I've got the door open. My, my bad. I shut the door and you wouldn't have heard him. All right, let's get back. So we've talked about formative, summative, and ipsative assessment. Now let's talk about the tools to do this with. So let's take a look at our good old friend, the Google form. So when I click on here and we go to the Google verse, <clears throat> we all kind of know what a Google form looks like. Um, and again, I'm going to start here in my Google Classroom. I'm going to click on the plus sign to create a new document. Not a new document, excuse me. I'm going to create, <laughs> sorry about that. I'm going to create a form. Now, the beauty of forms is, is a form can be multiple things. It can be a test. It can be multiple different kinds of tests. One of the things I think that we overlook in using Google Forms, it's in its capacity to be used as a survey. Um, and using it as a survey, you can use it as a survey in terms of multiple choice. How do you feel about this? But what I, or, or as check boxes, linear scales make all the sense in the world to me. If we were to survey our kids as we go through our teaching so that they could give us feedback as to how they feel about what we're doing, uh, I think I would do a better job. You give me feedback at the end of this course when you rate this course. The university 
looks at that, that feedback very, very seriously. So it's not like there's no precedent for this. Okay, let's, let's actually build one, sorry. So first thing you do is you wanna name your test or your survey. Can I do a survey instead of a test? Do the same thing in, in a way you describe them. Okay, so here's my first untitled question. Uh, and so if I'm doing a survey, and you know, it would help if I spell things correctly. If I'm doing a survey, and the first question I might ask is, your name. And I can come over here and you see it says short answer text. It's smart enough to know what, it, what you are asking for. You go up here and you click on the plus, and now it's waiting for you to design the next question. I am taking this class because, okay, again, I can come over here and I can change it up and I can ask for a short answer. Come back to here, plus sign again, come down here. I like taking the class online. Now, this is where we could try a linear scale. So one would be, I do not like this online class. And five would be, I love taking this online class. Okay. And you just keep going. Sign again. Ask the question. Uh, let's see. Let's do multiple. Let's do check boxes. Okay. So for this one. Okay. And. And as you can see, I just keep going down through here. And just keep going. Simple as that. Um, you know, cleaning it up, you come over here and you can basically just X things out if you don't want it. Uh, other things that it can do is you'll notice every one of these questions has a little picture icon that pops up beside it. It allows you to insert an image from wherever you got it. <laughs> and that's it. It's, it's just that easy to do. I can make it a required thing. I can copy it. I can, of course, trash it. And when I when kids take the survey, you come up here and you click on that and you'll get the responses back that they have given you. And of course, again, I would do this either in an in, I can send it via an email or I can just make a link and put the link into my Google Classroom. Um, I don't have any email addresses in this, so copy it, take it over to my Google Classroom and put it in.
Simple as that. Click this up here. And I could keep going here, but I think you get the idea. Now, the beauty, of course, of it being in my uh, Google Drive, and you know what the beauty of it is, is it's now easy for me to leave it there. And when I need it, I can go in and bring it into where my class classes might be. I could sit here and go through and create little quizzes, little quizzes, little quizzes. But I think you also, I hope, are seeing that the beauty of it is, is I can do this on the fly. That was Google Forms. Didn't take much time to do that, did it? It's a very simple, very easy tool to use. Oh, also notice I forgot to point out the boxes over here. Let me go through that real fast. So this is where you can import questions. So if you have a form that has questions on it already and you want to use them in this particular form or test or survey, you can do that. You can add title and description, which I've already done. Um, here's where you can put in your pictures. Here's where you can put in that YouTube video if you want to. And here's where you can add a section. So in other words, if you want to have a section that might be over a certain part of the information that you're teaching, you can divide it up into different parts. It is probably the one area that most people are very comfortable with using after you play with it for a little while. Now I want to show you where we are. This is Nearpod. Nearpod is a phenomenon. 11 years ago, when I first discovered uh, Nearpod and started showing it off to, well, my classes at UofL, as well as in presentations at conferences and so on, I couldn't even have begun to imagine how big this thing would get. And boy, has it ever. Um, if you are the kind of person who is fascinated by the whole patron, uh, teachers pay teachers movement that's out there, you might want to take a good, good long look at Nearpod. And I'll show you what I mean here in just a second. You can create content for Nearpod. Now, you have to pass their, um, would I say rigorous? I don't find it all that rigorous, frankly, <laughs> but you have to pass their standards for content. Um, and then you can actually put things into it. You set up your PayPal account and if people use your stuff, you get paid for it. Kind of cool. Let me log out just so I can show you how to get in because I'm going to let you have uh, access to my account. Um, and the reason why I'm doing that is, is you get the full thing because it's a paid account. Uh, I have done this with teachers, like I said, for about 11 years now. Jefferson County Public Schools, after I kept showing this and showing this, finally went out and bought a license for the district. Uh, if you work in a school where you have the capability of doing that kind of thing, please sit down with your administrators and have a long conversation about Nearpod. It just got as good as it gets, especially if you're either working toward or have a one-to-one -one classroom, you need to have Nearpod in your toolbox. It is about as good as it gets. Now, if you want to use my Nearpod account, um, here it is. And to log into it, you basically go to sbswan02 at Louisville dot edu make sure you get that fbswan02 at louisville edu and then the password is ulit241 i think that's lowercase you know i haven't had to log in in so long i don't remember let me try it let's make sure okay it is ulit241 all uppercase There we go. Here it is. So what can you do here? Oh my goodness. 
what can't you do? So the first thing you have to realize is don't let it overwhelm you. Now, as you can see, I've had people in here and they've used it uh, for their classroom. Please feel free, if you want to, to use the Nearpod for your class use. And to do that, you'd come up here and you click on folder, and then you can create a folder and you can call it Swan's class, your class, whatever you want to call it. And then it'll give you these nice little folders here that you then can create things for your classroom. So here's a, a young man who created one for his, um, I believe, let's, let's look. I'm not going to go in and look at it. You get the idea. It was for his human geography class, I think it was. And I have, you have lots of these in here. Okay. So how do we create? Well, that's the beauty of Nearpod. You don't have to recreate the wheel. You can basically go in and look around and see if you can find stuff. Now, the bad news is people have caught on pretty fast to the fact that this stuff is you can actually charge people for it. So you have to deal with that. Uh, let's, let's go ahead and grab something and look at it. And then we'll see uh, how it works. And then we'll come back to creating one. Um, and then I'll turn you loose with it. So when you click here, as you can see, we have a lesson here that's on motion. And the beauty of it is, I think it's free. Let's go look. And if I click on live lesson, what it does at that point is it does two things. If I have every kid in the room has a, a device in their hands and they're on the Nearpod site up there in the upper left hand corner, there's a place where they can put a code in. Here's the code. When they put that code in, what happens is you take over their machines. You control the pace at which they see the presentation that you want to give. Other way, look at this right here. So the other way I can do it is I can click on my Google Classroom. I can go find my Google Classroom. And I can decide how I want this to go into my Google Classroom. So I might put it in as an announcement. Go. And now, as you can see, it's basically allowing me the same kind of setup as I would have in my Google Classroom. Now, at this point, when I put it in there, I'm putting this in before class. And then when we get ready, they're going to click on it and then it goes over here and then I, I control their computers. So I'll do a post. And now it's in everybody's Google Classroom waiting. See? It's right there. So when I click on it, I can go in and as you can see, it's saying, you know, do the same thing, join and all that. All right, let's get out of it so you can see what it looks like. So here is one of the coolest things about it is, is the amount of stuff that you can put into it. And this is taken from the um, FET that we looked at last week. And you basically just work your way through the slide. See, I can, here's your prior knowledge, here's what you need to know, here's your essential question. Here's the learning objectives, here's the why. Here's what we're going to do. Let's get going. So on the next slide, we're going to watch a video. And again, if I'm controlling everything, I can decide that I want to watch on all videos or just, I mean, all computers or iPads, whatever. Because this thing is available on iPads. It's available on Chromebooks. It's available on uh, just regular computers. It's available on tablets that are Android based. It's available on everything. So I've got a video I can watch. 
and I it basically is talking me through what I can do in terms of what is potential energy. It's giving us examples of what potential energy is, and then it tells us what it is. Keep working my way through it. Now we're doing kinetic practice. And I have this amazing um, ability to see what kids did on the questions they're asking. By the way, I'm seeing this as a teacher. That's why it looks the way it does. Okay. And notice if I'm a kid and I need to go back and look at it again, it lets me do that. Isn't that great? Now, that's one example. Let's go and jump out of here. And let me show you the other way that you can do something like that. This is called student paste. Now with student paste, what you do is you basically work through it at your pace. And when you do that, you are working as, to me, it's kind of like homework. And you can do it at your own pace you can look at all the resources again. You see, I can put it in here. Uh, let's go ahead and put it in that class again. Okay. And I'm going to say go. Oh, wait a minute. I got to put it in as an action. Sorry about that. Let's do it as a question. Now go. Let's look at this. Okay. And. Off we go. So here I am. I'm doing this at my pace. I'm walking through it. Did you see the HDR back there? Is this crazy or what? So as a part of this, we get to go and, and stand on one of the tallest buildings in the world and look around. Yeah. <laughs> well, here's an open-ended question for you. Oops, I popped. Went through it too fast. Okay, what's my open-ended question? How would you define mass and weight? Write your own definitions. Okay. Here's a poll. True or false? Mass and weight are the same thing. Yeah, we know it's false. Just keep on going. So now we're going to investigate math, mass, and, we and uh, weight. And again, we're taking, we're checking for understanding as we go through this. And I, I just can't say enough about this. Now it's thrown me over into the FET. Uh, where I can actually play with real in real time uh, interactions with content. Um, yep, it just doesn't get any better, folks. All right, it's enough of that. Let me get us back. <laughs> Let me get us out of here, and let's go back and start from the beginning. And I'll show you how you then can create your own. Well, one of the things that uh, I'm getting ahead of myself, uh, I, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm a big Nearpod fan. Down here where it says sub plans, you can load stuff up with what you want them to use. Here's a former student of mine, there's hers. Um, but let's, I digress, let's get over here and look. 
So we're going to create a new lesson in Nearpod. And I can create a new lesson by either I can start with adding slides or, as you can see down here, I can upload files. So if I had a PowerPoint that I wanted to bring into here and then bring it to life by all the things that I can put into it, let's see if I can go find, um, it should be connected to my Dropbox account. Let's go see if I can find that PowerPoint that we did back at the beginning of class about TPAC. And I apologize, I should have had this ready and loaded up for us. Well, and I don't. Okay, we'll grab that one. Just so you can see what it looks like. Okay. So now what it's doing is it's bringing in my PowerPoint. Now, the beauty of it is, is when it comes in, I can play with it. In other words, I don't have to just, it won't just be my PowerPoint. If I come over here and add a slide, as you can see, it allows me to add content, add, well, there we go. I can add, here's my little ubiquitous classroom PowerPoint. I can add a slide, let's go back to that. I can add content, and look what I can put in here. I can put in uh, a Nearpod 3D. I can go and find something from the FET simulation folks. I can do a field trip. I can do a BBC video. I can do a Sway, which is an Adobe product. Here's where I could add another slideshow if I wanted to. My goodness gracious. Here's where I could do a video. And of course, we know what that means. There you go. Hello, Mr. Video. Easy, easy. I can add web content. So this would be where I could send somebody to look at more information about what we're doing. And here's where it just sits up and begs to be paid attention to. I can put in all of these different kinds of activities. I can do things um, as straightforward as an open-ended question, a quiz. There we go. And I can put in my question answers. And I can add a reference over here. So this would be if there's something that I need to put in to help you remember what you're doing. And then I'll save it. Oh, sorry. Let's do a correct answer. My bad. Okay. That has now been put in into this little thing that I've created. See, right here. And of course, I can drag it around anywhere within the presentation. So I can start with the presentation, and then as I'm working through it, I can then add it into wherever I want. This is one of my favorites right here. The time to climb. Remember our little discussion about ipsative assessment? Here you go. In other words, you can put in the question and people can progressively get better and better with their understandings. Nearpod 3D. <laughs> this is, um, I'm going to call this, this isn't, this is an unfinished work. How about that? Uh, I think, you know, 
they're going to get better and better with it. But it's kind of like, well, what do you got? And this is what they've got. So I'm not really sure, boy, if I were doing a study of the human body, though, wow, would I be in business? And, of course, if I were doing something like what we're dealing with right now, I could uh, put that in as well. Field trip. Would you like to go somewhere and investigate? So if I wanted to have kids experience what it might be like to go somewhere and talk about it, I could do it right here. So if let's pick DC and we can preview it, make sure it's what we want to play with. And as you can see, I can spin around and see the Capitol building. If I wanted to, yeah, I have my VR glasses on and now I can turn my head and see everything. Crazy, huh? Go ahead and throw that in there as well. You're seeing what I'm doing is I'm putting all of this kind of content that I can add into a very straightforward system here. I, I, I think what I love about it the most is the ability of it to present a multitude of different ways of assessing. Uh, so you're not just dependent upon multiple choice tests. This is flip cards. <laughs> this is just good old flip cards that you could put in here and, and have kids, um, you know, play with them. And you could put a final question in. Click on next. Well, I gotta put all the questions in, but then if I clicked on next, what it would do is it would let me put in the question. Just doesn't get any better. Here's Flipgrid, do you know what Flipgrid is? So Flipgrid is basically a way for you to crowdsource. Um, I started using Flipgrids and I kind of got turned off by it because it got to be too complicated. But what it does, if I had a class set of Chromebooks or if I had a one-to-one -one with devices that had cameras built into it, the coolness about building the Flipgrid and then putting it in here would be your kids could then respond to a question by just talking to the camera on their device and then it would be added in to this as well. The problem I had with, with Flipgrid, to go back to it, was that it got really, um, it got really concerned about young children and I agree. And then I didn't feel like it was doing a very good job of keeping that side of what it did safe and I haven't been back to it in a while. So I don't know if they've cleaned that up or gotten it better or whatever. Um, it was created by a group of people out of University of Minnesota. And that's how I got word of it. And I kind of wanted to, and I did. I had it in every, every one of my classes. We had a flip grid that we did at the beginning of class as a way of people introducing themselves. If you think about an online class, you don't see anybody. And you don't even see me. But if you had a flip grid at the beginning where everybody had to go in and basically leave a, hi, I'm Steve, and this is, you know, I'll be your teacher, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Well, it works. Nearpod. Well, let's review. Your Nearpod is an amazing place for you to work in. Um, and as you can see, they're, they're right on it over here. Um, you could build an entire suite of resources in the Nearpod. I know that schools do this. In fact, the schools that I taught, they have created lessons all over the place that help them 
in situations like this. It first started out as being snow day school. Lots of schools in Jeff County and uh, the archdiocese use this for snow day school. I think it should, if you're building a one-to-one -one classroom, this is one of the tools that needs to be brought into the discussion. Remember, we're all about um, what Fullen teaches us about being change agents. We need to have a sit down and a long discussion about how do we go about bringing this into um, our classrooms. Is there anything else that I need to show you here? Oh, they do have a library. And again, the problem I have with the library is you can go in here and you can basically, you know, tell what you're looking for. Just pay attention because see, most of this stuff is paid, but there are frees. You just have to kind of look for them. Is is it better? Is the is the paid stuff better? <sighs> I don't know. I think the paid stuff. Um, I think I think the paid stuff. Let's go in here and look at this one. This is for you, Jessica. Uh, let's look at a bundle here that is for language arts. Uh, reading, finding a theme, writing sequence of events, so on. Let's go look at one of his uh, his Nearpods here, and let's see what it looks like. So we can do a preview. And as you can see, he basically, whoop. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I was wondering what that was. I'm looking at that, and I'm going, wait a minute. This isn't... Uh, middle school I click on something I shouldn't have but you get the idea here here we go we're back so we have these these uh, really some nice stuff you just have to really look at it closely to see if it works for you um, He has a lot of nice stuff here. And you can add it to your to your library. Now, when you go to add it to your library, or you can do this. Dun, da, da, dun. And you can put it over into, by getting the link, you can put it over into your Google Classroom. All right, Nearpod. I think I beat it to death. I just love Nearpod. Now, let's go look at another one. If you think I'm crazy about Nearpod, look at this one. This is called Edpuzzle. So what's so great about Edpuzzle? Well, Edpuzzle takes the sort of standard, almost stereotypical idea that we seem to have that putting a video into a technology-based lesson is enough. And it's, you know, you see it, of course, in the Google Classroom. Tons and tons and tons of, of videos that people can put into their Google Classroom. What's the problem with it? Well, it's basically whatever someone else has created. And so you're left with just saying, yeah, that, that looks pretty good. That's pretty close to what I do. And if somebody comes along like me and says, well, could you create your own Google uh, videos, your own YouTube videos? Well, I don't have the time for that, Steve. You're right. But let me show you this. So I'm going to go in here and sign up for an account. I would start using it as a teacher, obviously. And here is the trick. Trick, sign in with your Google account. Okay? Now, I used to use this and I would let people have the access to my, you know, Steve Swan account with this. But what I found was if you'll sign in with your Google account, it will then recognize your Google Classroom 
And when you then assign things, and if you put a formative assessment inside the YouTube video, what? Yep. It will then put it into your Google Classroom, the score the kid gets. All right. So here we go. Sign in with Google. There's me. And here we are. So I have already created or let people create stuff. And what I wanted you to see is this over here. So in the Google, all I can rely upon is that. But here in the Edpuzzle, I've got all of these different channels that I can dive into. My goodness gracious, look at that. Naturally, you're right. I'm not a big fan of Khan Academy, but boy, if I can find something that works from Khan Academy, it works. Um, and of course, in, you know, good old reliable YouTube. Uh, and the nice thing about it is, these are clean YouTubes. I don't know how else to describe that. In other words, there's 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 no ads. There's none of the recommendations or anything like that. Um, look at the National Geographic stuff. Okay, you've got all kinds of choices here. Now let's go ahead and just jump in to our good old friend of the uh, the YouTube and. Oh, look, I could do a create a quiz. <laughs> Let's do that one. So I'm going to go ahead and grab this one. And I'm going to use, I'm going to, first of all, I'm going to watch it just so I can see what it's like. Okay. Now, what I want to do is somebody's already done this. So I'm going to edit it. And once I do the edit, what I can do with this is I can add things into this All right, you get the idea. I can watch it. But look what else I can do. I can come in here and I can decide that I want to do a voiceover. Now, if I do a voiceover, I'm basically going to wipe out whatever that person has done in there. But the beauty of it is, is I have the ability to decide what I want to uh, want to say. The other thing I can do is I can go in and I can do a cut and I can decide where I want my video to start where I might want it to, if I wanted to end, you see what I'm doing? And so as you can see, it's going to start here. I can go in and I can say, I want to have a cut there. So I can add a cut. I can undo it. Uh, I could get rid of it if I want to, or I could just come down here and grab the tail in and drag it up. So in other words, what I'm doing here is I can decide how I want my video. What, what part of it did I want to have in that video? Now, when I do that, I can come in here and I can decide if I want to change up the way this thing sounds. So as you can hear, Okay, you can see that all this is now what I really wanted to focus down on. And then I can do this. So now I can add questions and I own all of this. So I could jump in here and I could say, I come back out here. Okay. 
<laughs> and then I can put my, you know, answers in here. Uh, let me just go ahead and put some answers in. That way it'll let me use it. Okay, now I'm going to save it. So what it does now is it has put in a quiz. And so when the when it plays it, what it will do is it will stop the video until you do the quiz. Let's go ahead and finish this. And let's see what it looks like now. And then you get, there's your quiz. Okay. So it throws a quiz at you. When you take the quiz, you can either rewatch or you can answer it, submit, and then continue. Cool, huh? Now, here's where it really sits up and begs to be paid attention to. Assign it. And as you can see, I have two Google Classrooms that have already been, I've already connected to. To add it to a class, all you do is come down here and you go add new class. And if you already have a class, you can basically just go in and let, you know, it put in the information or you just go over here and you go import a class, a Google Classroom, and then it shows you all the different classrooms you might have. Of course, I got too many. So you can see I've already picked that one. I picked my Google Classroom. That'd be the one that I want to use. Now, the beauty of it is, this is now in my Google Classroom. In other words, it's there. I can assign it to my Google Classroom. I can say I, the day is where I want it to be. I don't want you, I don't want to allow you to uh, skip through it. Uh, I want you to post on Google Classroom, bam, uh, if I need to, bam, and then assign. Okay. It's now in my Google Classroom. And there are the questions. And this would be the students, of course, that I have in my Google Classroom. The Edpuzzle people have taken a page from Nearpod over here. As you can see, you can go live. <laughs> so if you wanted to do this in your Google Classroom with everybody being there, it automatically grabs everybody together and start. And now I control And then you can see there's the question that it would come up. And then I would wait for every kid to put in there, you know, and you can see right here, zero out of zero have answered. So I'll find out who's watched it. Then I can keep going. And if I wanted to, I can show the responses, the responses, excuse me. <laughs> and we could do a quick, to make sure that we're all working together. We all understand and we move on. And I can exit live load. That was a lot. I hope you'll take the time. All the tutorials, everything is in here for you to work with. Um, and I hope you'll take the time to really take a look at this because I use these three for the following reasons. Google Forms is what's in the classroom. And this, and this is the shell that we're working within. In other words, we're looking at the ubiquitous classroom that Mayer talks about. And we are using the tool that's readily available to us, which is Google Forms. Um, right away, I think, what, what do we see? Google Forms is a really quick, down and dirty way of creating a way to check for student understanding, 
more importantly, from my standpoint, it's a way for checking student understanding and how they're doing. And it gives you that sort of anonymous way of letting kids talk back to you. Nearpod. Nearpod is front to back almost a, a complete curricular creation program. You could put your entire curriculum into a Nearpod. Um, the only downside that I see to Nearpod, and we actually had this happen very early on when I was working with uh, teachers with this program, and you know what that is, digital access. So what do the kids do that are sitting in your classroom that can't go home to a computer or to a tablet? Remember, you can do it on either. What do we do with those kids? Um, we had a school that I worked with, a young man who was an Algebra 2 teacher, a very good Algebra 2 teacher. And we were looking at using Nearpod with his kids. And this was a, this was a school where you basically had to apply to go to that school. Um, you know, you just, it wasn't, it had resides kids, but the vast majority of the kids in the building were kids who had applied to go there, uh, magnet school. And when we set all this up, who did we forget? We forgot the kids that didn't have the digital access at home. They may have had a computer, but they didn't have Wi-Fi at home. And so what we had to do is we had to open up uh, the computer labs in the building for after school use. Now, Nearpod solved the problem for us. This was high school, by the way. Nearpod solved the problem for us. How? They put it on as an app on your phone. Problem solved. But, you know, that's going to be the thing that's going to catch us on any of this. Edpuzzle, I, I just have a... Um, there's so much about Edpuzzle that I just can't... I just love it to death for the following reasons, I think. The fact that... It takes content that's already been created by somebody else, but allows you to put your specific uh, take on things that you would like to, to help kids understand. In other words, don't just go out and grab a video and throw it in here. Take the time to watch the video. Take the time to understand what it's about. And then you can go in and you can do the kinds of things that you want to do with it. You can add the sort of um, descriptions. You can go in and you can add your take on things. You can go in and say, I only need this small part. I don't need all of this video. And you can go in and add your own voice to it. And it's just as easy as that. So now it's start. I'm starting to record. I'm recording now. And I'm recording right over that guy that was just talking. And I can put my voice in here so that the kids hear me talking about it. Okay. And then it goes through and it puts a little thing in there that says, this is where Steve was talking. Now, let me show you what happens when you do that. Okay. What happened there was that as I'm talking, he stops. So I have the incredible opportunity here to say to my kids, stop, pay attention to this, Look at what we're doing. Or I could be at the very beginning and again, setting up. Here's what we're going to be doing in this video. Pay particular attention to this, this, and this. And along the way, we'll check in for your understanding with some formative assessments. Now watch how this works. Okay, simple. And then you finish it up 
And if you have set it up right, you can then just put it into your Google Classroom. Wow, there's a lot of stuff today. I hope that um, you're doing okay. Uh, I hope you're staying well. Uh, we are rapidly coming to the end of the class. We only have two more modules. Next week's module is takes a totally different track um, than what we have been doing because everything up to now, as you know, has been all about the Fullen book and the various people he talks about in the Fullen book and the ideas around the Fullen book. Um, and then we went into his ideas of Google Classroom as the ubiquitous classroom, the skinny, the ability for kids to have 24 seven access to stuff, all this kinds of things that allows, that the Google Classroom allows you to do. We took a little side trip about talking about digital natives. Um, are they real? You know, you know my feelings about that. And then last week and the, today, we've talked about the irresistibly engaging classroom that we know that it has to be efficient, it has to be ubiquitous, and it has to be steeped in real life problem solving. And it has to meet these ideas about full ends deep learning, which is critical thinking and problem solving, communication, collaboration, creative thinking and imagination, character education, and citizenship. Heavy stuff, huh? Well, we're going to leave that behind for the next two. And we're going to take a look at being in the classroom. And why do I do this? Well, I think kids learning how to code. I'm a big believer in kids learning uh, music. And I'm a big believer in kids learning how to code. Why? Because it requires you to learn a certain way of thinking. That linear thinking but more importantly, that problem-solving thinking. And the understanding that failure is a teacher. Now, we're not gonna go too far into this. We're gonna play around with, um, we'll take a look at the Google Take coding, but where we're gonna spend the quality time is right here. We're gonna understand a little bit about using a online coding program called Scratch from MIT. Uh, Scratch is what's called an OOPS, O-O-P-S. It's object-oriented programming system. And what it basically allows you to do is you use little blocks and you move them into um, certain orders and they cause things to happen to things that are on the screen, hence the same object-oriented programming system. And as you can see here, here are some of the things that we can play with. Watch this video. And then down here, because I love you so much, here you go. <laughs> if this really blows you away and you're really scared about doing all this, there's your design. There's your first game that you can build. Please use it. Don't be afraid to steal it. What I'll ask you to do next week is to switch it up. In other words, once we see how all this works, just go in and tweak it up a little bit, just so you can see how it can be done. And down here, I've got some even more um, help for you. And then here's how you put it into your Google Classroom. Okay? So we'll do that next week. And then the following week after that, we'll finish out the class with an investigation into another amazing area called VR and AR. This is, this is hard to do over, uh, you know, an online class, but I think, I think we'll be okay. What we're going to be asking you to do is we'll be using another online uh, tool called CoSpaces. If you want to use CoSpaces with your kids, just yell at me, um, and I'll show you how you can put a class in and We'll have seats for everybody. I think I have 30 seats. Um, the easy way to do it is, in fact, it's the way I'll show you that I've already set it up, 
is I have it student one, student two, student three, student four through 30. And then I have a generic password, you know, for each one of them. So if you have more than 30 kids and you want to give it a swing, we can basically just say, okay, so kid, uh, you're going to share it with kid uh, student one, you know, and as long as kids don't go and try to overwrite the, each other, they're fine. This is probably uh, as far out there <laughs> as I can take you because using virtual reality and augmentative reality, although, you know, today I was uh, looking and yesterday I was teaching a, a class on creativity and we were looking at aug augmentative reality. And one of the things we were looking at is I was showing them how that there is, a, and this is, this is for uh, Stephen, there is a program out there called Go Noodle, and I know Steve knows what that is. It's a series uh, that's all about getting kids up and moving, using technology and videos and so on. They have an AR one that you can put up that basically allows kids to dance and pop bubbles. Um, and all you have to do is basically have an iPad available that would then capture their moving around and it puts them into the pop bubbles song and they jump around and touch the bubbles and pop them. So this is not far that far out folks. We're, this is where we could be heading. I don't think we figured it out yet. I do not, uh, here's my bias. I do not want to just have kids wearing goggles. This, I do not want kids just playing games. I want kids knowing how to build this stuff. All right. As always, if you need me, if you need to talk to me, you know how to reach me, 502-457-2937. I'm always here for you. I'm always ready to help in any way I can. We are fast finishing up, and I hope that you've enjoyed this class as much as I have um, teaching this class.